Good day, philosophers, and welcome as we uh, once again continue reading Ray Descartes, Rene Descartes' Discourse on Method, right? And we just finished book one, or um, part one. And in part one, Descartes really examined his education, contrasting mathematics and philosophy. And in the end, we realized, according to Descartes, that we really needed to, uh, uh, to achieve a new foundation for philosophy, that fundamentally um, philosophy lacked certainty and it lacked usefulness. And he, he seeks to achieve that for philosophy and he uses mathematics as a kind of model and in this uh, video and in part two of Descartes' Discourse on Method, we're going to see Descartes uh, attempting to come up with this method to help us find an absolutely certain foundation for philosophy, right? And for him, that concept of foundation is foundational. It's it's essential to see that well, we must begin with something that cannot be doubted so that we can arrive at the, uh, the kind of philosophical certainty that we desire. So, Recall that he said that we're no longer going to read books like this book or read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics or any of that stuff. Instead, we're going to turn to turn within ourselves and read the great book of the world, right? And in particular, this is true as Descartes tries to achieve certainty in philosophy, right? And so um, let's begin just reading parts of part two. And we're going to see that when he talks about turning in toward himself, he quite, uh, the, the way he depicts his autobiography here is it's almost quite literal, right? He describes here, he says, I was in Germany where the occasion the wars were not yet over there, and, and he continues um, eventually talking about how he shut himself off by himself in a stove heated room, right, where he conversed with myself about my thoughts. Right? So Descartes is, is sitting there alone, sitting in a room. He almost is this image of what a lot of us think of when we think of uh, people being uh, philosophers, right? Um, not the image of Socrates walking around, chatting people in conversation, uh, Aristotle engaging people in conversation, um, that, that idea that contemplation is a lived experience in a community, but we have the sort of contemplative person who, who sits alone thinking really hard. And Descartes is literally painting that picture for us. So what does he begin thinking about here in part two of the discourse, right? Well, he begins with the thought of perfection, right? The idea of perfection. And he says, among them, one of the first was it occurred to me to consider that there is often not so much perfection in works composed of many pieces made by the hands of various master craftsmen as there are in those works on which but a single individual has worked, right? Descartes thinks about this idea and the source of perfection. And here's an interesting thing. Uh, in another video, you're going to see us return to the idea of the source of perfection and how him thinking about what the true source of perfection is um, will, will have an immense impact on what we can actually know about reality itself. It's going to get kind of crazy. But anyways, for now, just thinking about the source of perfection, he says that thing, the, sort, the best way to get something that's perfect is to have something that's made by a single individual as opposed to being made by lots of folks. Now, does this sound a little bit almost like Plato? I mean, Plato didn't specifically talk about making things that are perfect, but remember when um, we saw in Plato and Socrates the concept of the one versus the many, right? We saw it in the, time, in, in the idea of time versus eternity, the forms versus all the things that participate in the forms. Anyway, there's there even though Descartes sits there and he rejects things in the history of philosophy, there's many aspects of this history of philosophy that are still sort of alive in his thought, I would argue, right? But and let's go back to his idea. What, what, Where do you get more perfect things that are made, right? So do you want to have like a lot of carpenters working on a table or just one carpenter, right? Um, I play guitar. I like thinking about guitars and things like that. And for instance, um, the, the the company Fender has many different lines of guitars. They, they have the, the, uh, the American Standard line, which is a pretty nice, expensive guitar guitar and a good American standard guitar could cost you like 600 to a thousand, maybe 1200 bucks or so, but you can also get custom built Fender guitars, right? Um, and they're, and they're nice. They're, they're going to double in value uh, or double. In, I don't know if they really double in value, but they double in cost. And then they have this master built line, right? And the master built guitars are these guitars that are supposed to be built by by a single master craftsman, right? And and if you look up the, the Fender's uh, website, you'll see they, they describe and they say, in every art form, there are those who have mastered their craft so thoroughly through years of training and experience. Uh, their work routinely commands extra acclaim and admiration, not to mention outright awe. And if you want to have one of these guitars, you can spend five to 10,000 or even more dollars, right? And of course, this, here's an image of a master built Fender guitar. And it, I mean, it looks, it's brand new, but it just looks really old. And I'm sure it sounds great and plays awesome. Um, I don't know if it's worth 
worth the cost. I, I'll never own one um, for lots of reasons, right? And, and in reality, I don't even think I would need to buy one that's that expensive. But anyways, so there we go. Let's continue. Um, so, uh, so something like guitars, we could see though that there is a special value in having a single person work on it. Now, Descartes, it doesn't just think about like carpentry and such. We could even think about something like this. Now, what do you see here? This do you recognize this? This is Manhattan, right? In the in the in the city of Manhattan, if you just look at this map, this is essentially like a map, and you can see in the, all the white lines, the little street, um, uh, our streets and and things like that. If you, one thing that's interesting about Manhattan when you look at it, um, you see this like really distinct grid pattern for the most part, right? You have all the um the streets, and then you have um all the avenues, um. So the streets all uh, are horizontal. The avenues are all vertical. Um, you occasionally have um, uh, then like Broadway, you see kind of cutting cutting through this. But but uh, why does Manhattan look like this, right? Um, well, and, it, and does all of Manhattan look at like this? If you take a look at the bottom of Manhattan, you see at the bottom of the map there, um, I can really zoom in on that. You'll see here at the bottom of Manhattan, it doesn't, does, doesn't have the same grid pattern. Why is that? Why is most of Manhattan this this extremely well organized grid pattern, but the bottom Manhattan, where you have a lot of famous neighborhoods um, like uh, the West Village, Tribeca, Soho, the Lower East Side, you have all these. Well, um, why don't we have the same grid pattern there? Well, it's because uh, the original parts of Manhattan, at least to my understanding, were, were, were this lower part of Manhattan. Uh, Manhattan was actually one of the first planned cities in, in, um, in the world, and certainly in America. Like, it was an organized uh, section of a city. They, it didn't just sort of happen. They, they decided to level the island of Manhattan as best they could, and they they had engineers plan uh, what the city should look like. And there was really um, a, a small group of uh, um, planners that were involved on this. But I think there was one guy in particular, I forget his name off the top of my head. But but Manhattan got this way because of a single individual who had a plan from the beginning. And I, I use this example in part motivated by something Descartes actually says. He refers to ancient cities and, and how they're related to perfection, right? He says, uh, thus one sees that buildings undertaken and completed by a single architect are usually more attractive and better ordered than those which many architects had tried to patch up by using old walls that had been built for other purposes. Thus those ancient, this is the real part here, those ancient cities were once mere villages and in the course of time have become large towns are usually so poorly laid out compared to those well-ordered places that an engineer traces on a vacant plane as suits his fancy. And he continues on here. Actually, I went to college in Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh is a city that grew up piecemeal. There's all these little neighborhoods and they jam up next to each other and roads, uh, the roads, the roads don't always go the way that you would expect. It's it's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, I, I enjoyed my time in Pittsburgh, um, but it is not a well-organized uh, community as a whole. If you look within it, can, each individual community, it's pretty organized, but if you try to um, get it all fit together, you get something that looks like this in the lower part of Manhattan where you got all these weird angles. You have, you have Pentagon properties. Um, you have, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, issues um, that arise from the, the little bit of disarray. Uh, so isn't that a big deal? I don't know. But then Descartes thinks about perfection even a step further. He doesn't just think about things that we build, but he even thinks about ideas that we have. And he starts with laws. He thinks about the laws that we have. Same thing, think about the laws we have in America. How many laws do we have? We have a ridiculous number of laws, right? And why do we have so many laws? Well, Descartes kind of describes here, right? Uh, thus, I imagine that peoples who, having been once sa half savages and having been civilized only little by little, have made their laws only to the extent that the inconvenience due to crimes and quarrels have forced them to do so, right? When you think about it, that's where most of our laws come from. We don't, we didn't start with a, a, a beautiful set of laws that we just sort of live with throughout our lives. Um, no, uh, the laws that we we create tend to come out of need. We we have issues that we're trying to deal with, and then in response, we we write a law that um, that forbids certain kinds of activities, right? And so everything is sort of this reactionary thing, right? Most of our laws are completely reactionary. So laws come together in this piecemeal well. And Descartes said, wouldn't it be better if there was like a beautiful set of laws that were pre-established and that we could live accord and not just have them come up um, uh, chance, you know, by chance essentially? And then Descartes goes even a little bit further, not just laws, but then to all of our learning. 
He said he thinks about book learning and he thinks about how many books that are there that that so long as they're not demonstrations. And by, by demonstrations, he basically means mathematical proofs. And if you want to know about mathematical proofs, you can go back and watch the video that 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 was all on looking how math is a model for the foundation of certainty in um, in philosophy for Descartes. But uh, Descartes says, so long as we don't actually have real demonstrations, um, the, the, even most of the book learning you have isn't as good as you would have found if you even just had like a single man of good sense, right? And then he even thinks about all of our, all of our personal beliefs. And he says, where do all of my beliefs come from? Where do my thoughts about reality, about what's good, what's bad, about um, what's true and what's false um, where do these ideas come from? And he says that we actually have many teachers, right? Um, he says, uh, for since we were children, like, and, and I'll read here, and thus too, I thought that because we were all children before being men, and because for a long time it was necessary for us to be governed by our appetites and, and our teachers, right? Um, it's nearly impossible for our judgments to be as pure and as solid as they would have been if we had the full use of our reason from the moment of our birth and if we've always been guided by it alone. Let's take a step back and let's think that we had to be raised by all kinds of teachers, right? Our appetites or our desires influenced the way that we acted and the things that we did. But, but we had all kinds of teachers, not, not just our, our teachers in school, but our parents are our fundamental first teachers. But our siblings, if you had them, they were your teachers. Your neighbors, they taught you things. The books that you read, the stories that you hear, the songs that you listen to, the movies that you watch, all of them are teaching you about reality. For instance, um, I meant to, actually that's right. I was going to put a little slide in uh, in here about this. But uh, when I was when my kids were very young, they they watched Thomas the Tank Engine. I don't know if you're familiar or you remember Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, but uh, Thomas the Tank Engine taught some very interesting lessons. Amongst them, Thomas taught that a good engine is a useful engine. A good engine is a useful engine. And so one of the goals of all the engines was to be as useful as possible. Now, here's an interesting thing that I would reflect on. Um, what, are you, what, what about an engine that doesn't seem useful anymore? Is it still good, right? And, and if, we if we take that principle out, what if we think about humans? What if there's humans that don't seem particularly useful? Are they not good and, and they should be discarded? The, the, the engines that weren't useful were supposed to be thrown away in Thomas the Tank Engine. What about people that don't seem useful? What about the very old? Are very old people who maybe don't have a use in society anymore, are they not of value? What about even the very young children? Children maybe have a great potential for use, but are not immediately useful right now. Um, what about people that just seem to be problem people that don't seem to be using things the right way, right? There, there's, there's a lot of issues with taking this principle that a good engine is a useful engine. And so there's a lot of things that somehow we, we learn along the way that if we're not thinking very critically about that, we might all of a sudden have a strange hodgepodge of beliefs that cause us to, to act in irrational and maybe wrong ways, right? And so what Descartes noticed here is he's, or not, not what he noticed, what he presents here is he says, what would have been best is that if we had our full use of our reason from the moment of our birth, that we could like be children who are rational, that fully understand and guide our thinking um, from the moment of our birth. Now, so he says, how can I ultimately become like a child again? This is what Descartes really wants to do. Remember, his goal is to be able to find a foundation for philosophy. He's searching for something we'll see that is absolutely certain, that cannot be doubted, that is self-evidently true. And he looks at all of his beliefs and he says they came from this hodgepodge of source, right? So how can I get down to something that is indubitably true, right? And so he starts thinking, right? Um, about what would it take to become like a child again, to, 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 to no longer have all the ideas and beliefs that I have, but to sort of break them down. It's similar to trying to wonder what would, what would it take to get that organized grid pattern back in Manhattan? Right? What would it take? What? What are? I mean, most of what I mean. What am? What am I saying? Um, I mean, most of Manhattan has this grid pattern. But what if we try to take um, Soho and uh, and all those neighborhoods and try to have their uh, street organization fit with the rest of Upper Man, Middle and Upper Manhattan? Um, what would it take? We, we'd have to tear it down. 
we'd have to destroy it. And Descartes reflects on that. He says, it's true that we never see anyone pulling down all the houses in the cities for the sole purpose of rebuilding them in a different style, though actually <laughs> I think people do do that, right? Um, <laughs> and of making the streets more attractive. But one does see very well that many people tear down their own houses in order to rebuild them, and that in some cases they're even forced to do so when their houses are in danger of collapsing and when the foundations are not secure. That phrase there, the foundations are not, I wish I would have highlighted, I should have, the foundations are not secure. And so when Descartes, again, he's reflecting, he says, the foundations of our beliefs are not secure because they came about in a haphazard way, just like um, um, uh, the, the city of Manhattan's part, part, uh, part <laughs> lower section is sort of occurred in a haphazard way, just like our laws are developed in a haphazard way. Our beliefs are developed in a haphazard way. And so what we need is a, the opposite of a haphazard method for uh, getting to what is absolutely certain so that we can um, achieve this goal of certainty in philosophy. It's going to have to begin with an absolutely certain foundation, just like the mathematical postulates, something that is indubitably true and will build upon it deductively to all the beliefs that we have. So here again, in discourse part two, we're going to try to see what are these principles of method, right? And so let's pause there and let's finish this thought in just another video. Hold that thought.